So we're going to begin our worship before we start with that opening hymn. We're going to start with the Wells Connection, which connects us with all the events that are happening in our church body worldwide. And today you're going to learn about one of our preparatory schools called Luther Preparatory School, which is the longest standing Lutheran high school in all of America. And you get to learn about that here in the video. Here we start. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Did you know that the oldest Lutheran high school in the United States is Luther Preparatory School in Watertown, Wisconsin? But, of course, it's more than just a high school. Luther Prep has a mission of encouraging and preparing the next generation of Wells pastors, teachers, and staff ministers for 155 years and counting. At first glance, Luther Prep looks much like any top-tier high school, with quality instruction, state-of-the-art classrooms, and a full slate of extracurriculars. Right now, I'm doing I'm an RA in the dorms during study hall. I've got, I'm in the fall play. Um, I'm playing football. I'm in the prep singers. I mean, I'm able to do all of that at the same time while also being around Jesus. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy. It's the connection to Jesus that sets this school apart. Because LPS is designed to be a key step in a lifetime of service to God's people. A mission that's been unchanged for 155 years. And I think that's what, like, what's, what makes our synod special because you see a consistency there and you see the same faith and you see the same passion for the gospel. Because the students here come from all over the country, and the world. Most live in dormitories on campus. That might seem like a hardship, but it actually fosters maturity and builds even stronger ties between parents and children. You will actually feel that you are closer to your child after the prep experience and closer to your child for the rest of his or her life. My faith has grown so much that I can have these higher level conversations with them about like God and thoughts that I'm having. Living on campus also builds deeper friendships with like-minded young people who encourage each other in their Christian faith. It's a truly incredible experience. You'll see, you'll see not only uh, your faith growing, you'll be able to see the faith within your friends growing too, which is an incredible thing to witness. It just makes it so much easier to be away, like then you don't even realize that you're gone and it's just, this becomes the home basically. Previously, their place of worship had of course been their primary. In a world that seems especially unstable this school year, it's comforting to know that the next generation of pastors, teachers, and staff ministers are as committed as ever to bringing the gospel of Christ to a world in need. They realize there are a lot of things going on in the world right now that show even greater the need that, that we have for a Savior. That need for people to go proclaim the Christ publicly in the classroom and from the pulpit will always be there and it's just very evident today. Currently, students at Luther Prep come from 25 states and six countries. Diversity that adds to our strength as we reach out in Jesus' name to people across cultures and around the world. With more than 400 students, Luther Prep's enrollment remains strong, preparing the new generation of faithful leadership for our congregations and schools. This morning for our worship, we'll follow the order of service, new service settings for morning praise, which is be, just pre printed on the on following slides. You're not going to be able to find it in your hymnal since it's the newer service settings. But we're going to open with our opening hymn, as I mentioned before. So we're going to start with a procession. And you don't have to come up, but I think a lot of people in your aisle would like to come up. So hopefully you can just come up and set your palms here during the hymn. And it's going to start to be introed right now. And when the music starts, you can come up.
Be seated. We now turn our attention to our first reading from Scripture for today from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. If you'd like to follow along, your Pew Bible is on page 1360. Here the prophet Zechariah foretells what's going to happen on Palm Sunday which we celebrate today. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is the word of our Lord. We'll now join in our psalm today. It's printed on the following slides, Psalm 63. Kurt will sing the verses, and we will join in the refrain. Is better than life. 
my lips will speak your praise. So I will bless you all my life. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul shall be filled as with a banquet. My mouth shall praise you with joy. In the morning I will sing, I will sing glad songs to you. I will sing glad songs of praise to you. I will sing glad songs of praise. On my bed, I remember you. On you, I muse through the night. For you have been my help. In the shadow of your wings, I rejoice. My soul clings to you. Your right hand. On Palm Sunday, we are reminded about Christ's humility for us and how he lived a humble life for us. Our second lesson comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, and we see how Jesus humbled himself to be our Savior, but then his humility led to him being exalted to the highest place, to the right hand of God the Father, where he has authority over all. We see that his humility truly made him the King of Kings. We read now from Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of our Lord. We now join in our next hymn, hymn 131, All Glory, Laud, and Honor.
Please now stand out of respect for the words and works of our Savior. Our gospel for this Palm Sunday is recorded in Mark chapter 11, the first 10 verses. Here we have the account of Jesus going into Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest heaven! This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated as we join in our next hymn, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty, Hymn 133. probably had the experience that I've often had where you're looking for something in the closet or garage or some type of storage but you couldn't find it because you had the wrong concept of what you were looking for you thought that it was in that square black box but really when you finally found it it was in that white flat box how frustrating that can be So you stared right at it, you saw it several times, you never even probably even moved it or opened it, and there's probably many times you moved it out of the way looking for the black square box. But you missed it because your mental picture of it was wrong. Most Jews in Jesus' day missed Jesus as their Messiah and King. Because they were looking for, and they had a completely different concept of what their Savior was supposed to be, it wasn't this guy. They thought that the Messiah would be this mighty and political deliverer to save them from the Romans. 
He would lead Israel and be the greatest nation of all time. They weren't looking for a lowly savior. This guy who chooses to ride on the colts, the foal of a donkey. They couldn't conceive of a suffering savior, of one who offered himself as the sacrifice for sinners. And so tragically, they missed out on the coming of their king. Many people still miss Jesus because of wrong expectations and wrong things that they have built up in their minds of who he needs to be for them. They're looking for a savior like the genie in Aladdin who will grant every wish at their command, but that genie never shows up. It has never happened. They want a savior who will instantly solve all their problems, their deepest and darkest problems, but those problems still remain and have never gone away. Or they expect a church where everyone loves one another, but a church member mistreated them, so they dropped out in bitter disappointment. In our first lesson for today, Zechariah is prophesying of the coming Messiah. The one that we just read about in the Gospel of Mark. And it was in the context of Zechariah's prophecy there in Zechariah 9 verses 9 to 10 that the Israelites were rebuilding the temple. And if you can know any, if you remember anything about history, the Israelites were rebuilding the temple because it had been sacked and they had been taken into captivity into Babylon. And so that temple was completely destroyed and all the contents were taken as well. And now here in the ninth chapter of Zechariah, the Israelites are free from their captivity. They're back in Israel. And Zechariah is prophesying to these people who have been saved from their slavery back and captivity back in Babylon, are now back in their home country And Zechariah is prophesying about the coming of their Messiah and what they should expect. The Lord was using Zechariah to comfort his people, the people that he had set apart for his purpose, and he wanted to co comfort them with a message of love. And at this moment, they really needed a lot of love, didn't they? They return back to this country that's desolate, destroyed, not like they knew of it before because it was taken over in war. So they needed this love and comfort. They needed a leader, a king who they could trust in. 100 years earlier, their king, Jehoiakim, was taken over by Nebuchadnezzar. You probably know some stories about Nebuchadnezzar from the Bible. He was the king in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was the one who had the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar was the one who constructed that 75-foot-tall gold image of himself that everyone was supposed to worship. And the Israelites, the Jews, they wanted to avoid having a king like this at all costs. And so the Lord was reassuring them through this prophet Zechariah that this king is not like those kings. This new king was coming, and he's bringing salvation. Salvation means not just to be saved. It means eternal life with him in heaven forever. Don't we all need a respectable, good leader also? Now, I don't want to get into politics here, but it seems like finding a good, respectable, honorable leader is getting harder and harder to come by, doesn't it? I'm not talking about any specific leader. Just in general, maybe 50% of the time we can find a leader that we can trust in. Maybe it's not even that. Zechariah is talking to us today also. 
about the coming of a king. A Messiah who brings comfort and love, who is not like any earthly king. He knows that on this earth, we will never be 100% happy with any leader that are in place. Because every single one of those leaders are exactly humans like us. Just think, if you were thrown into being the king or queen, do you think everybody would trust you and respect you? Why do we expect that of other leaders that are put in place when we couldn't even receive it ourselves? They make mistakes, and they will never be able to satisfy everyone, just like we can't. Because we all have different beliefs, don't we? But Zechariah, Zechariah comes with a message of comfort and a search for a leader that we may turn to at all times and trust him at all times, just as the Israelites needed, especially at that time. Zechariah reveals that the humble nature of this king to come is the one that's going to be coming in Jesus as their king. Dear friends, Jesus is your king too. And he reveals how he is not all about the glitz and glamour of all the rulers today. Humbly on Palm Sunday, he entered into Jerusalem riding on a young male donkey. He came to save the Israelites. He came to save us. He came to save all. And that's why we sing so many songs today that say, Hosanna, loud Hosanna, which means he saves. But here's the thing. Is this man riding on a donkey? Is Jesus the Savior, the King, the Messiah that you are looking for? Hear me out. How would you like your king to rule? One who is able to make all your pain go away? One who is able to protect you from any threat of terrorism? One who doesn't allow a pandemic to ensue all over the world? Maybe even one who will not let you suffer financially? My perfect picture of a king is one who does all of these things and allows us to live in a joy and happiness with no persecution or sadness. And isn't that the ideal king that we all look for? See your king comes to you, gentle, righteous and having salvation and riding on a donkey Look at how Jesus arrived in Jerusalem. Did he march in as one would expect the ultimate king would? Where's the army? Where's the kingly garb? What's up with this guy riding on this donkey and wearing everyday clothes like us? At first glance, it appears that there are many who are gathered around praising and thanking him Many people gathered around waving their palm branches and laying them down on the ground and even taking off their outer garments to lay down and create a path for him to walk on. And just four days later, this same humble man would be put on trial and be rejected. It appears that some of the same people who were gathered along the roadside yelling, Hosanna! would soon reject him and yell, crucify. What a turn of events. What is even more shocking is the turn of events that God pulls on us. Because of our imperfect nature and our absolute rejection of him as the king that we have pictured in our minds, and that we would not expect. We don't want punishment and rejection from him. 
our expectations of Jesus as our king many times turns out in this life to be sadness and rejection rather than looking at the hope of eternal life. But God, he pulls the ultimate role reversal. He humbly turns to you and says, the life that my son lived, the humble life that my son lived is yours. All that you have done, I forgive you through my son Jesus. God made him who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God has pulled this beautiful role reversal on us. Because of his son. He has freely given us life through Jesus Christ who went on his way to the cross to pay for every single one of our sins. And three days later, he powerfully rises from the dead, victorious on Easter morning. Jesus lived for you out of love. He should have ridden on a crushing Clydesdale, but we see him on a dilapidated donkey. Jesus was humble for you too. He was humble because he was on his way to the cross to bear our sin and to bear the ultimate punishment of death and being forsaken by his father in heaven. But he wasn't headed just to die. He was headed to peacefully rule for you like nothing we ever expected. In verse 10 of Zechariah chapter 9, the Lord promises kingdom, a kingdom of peace. And he says this, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This sounds like true peace to me. Here's the problem. Do you live in peace today? What about peace on a regular basis? I think we'd all agree our world really doesn't have peace, even though that's the canned answer that every contestant at Miss America wishes for world peace will never happen until Jesus comes again. Our world doesn't have peace. Our minds, they're rarely at peace. My family, relatives, relationships, all of these are never at peace at the same time. There's always something disturbing that peace Although many of us, I'm sure, are probably wishing everything was at peace in our lives. It's just not the case, is it? The Israelites, they felt no peace either. They were in captivity so long in this foreign nation. They wanted peace also. But they were not experiencing it. It's kind of hard to find peace when there are so many things happening. The Israelites were constantly fighting with other nations. They were fighting with their own people and with the constant struggle to find peace within themselves. Well, how about us? We have our own battles. How easy is it for us to get in an argument with one another? It doesn't take too much, does it? And maybe over what we eat. And we're in an argument there. How we drive or what we're going to watch on TV. Isn't it ironic that we see the ability to argue and not be happy inside of children too? 
I mean, when one child picks up a toy, it all of a sudden becomes a favorite toy for all the children. Or maybe you see somebody else choose the same donut that you wanted. It automatically becomes that favorite donut for the other child too. Sin has taken a hold of us. It stresses us out and it makes us to do, want to do more to get rid of all of this. But it always leaves us restless in the end and not at peace. Sin has caused us to live restless lives. It has caused us to live completely in turmoil and opposed to God's will of perfection. We want a king to solve all these problems. We want a king to bring us peace. And they say that Jesus is that king. We see Jesus on that donkey and we hear prophecy from Zechariah, but really, is this the king that's going to bring peace? As we think about what we have built up in our minds and what we expect our king to be and the one who brings peace, I don't think this is our initial thoughts of a king who brings peace. It is easy to see Jesus on that first Palm Sunday as a reject and a king, maybe for someone else, but not for us. Don't miss out on your Savior King. Our preconceived notions and our selfish demands easily take away from the glory that Jesus brings on this day. Jesus is a King we would least likely expect because what we expect is far too little and has been drawn up in our own sinful minds. Jesus came humbly to rule peacefully. He did not come just to rule one nation. He came to rule the entire world. He came to proclaim peace to the nations. And this peace will last forever. There will be no more slavery to sin where we are all filled with stress and restlessness, but rather we will be spiritually at peace with God and with each other. Jesus came to bring peace. And this has all been made possible because Jesus came bearing peace for all. Jesus was not a self-proclaimed dictator, but a God-sent diplomat. God sent his son as a mediator between himself and us. We have a perfect mediator who will never upset the other side. He has established the bond of peace with us and with the Father. What is so special about this peace that he brings is that it's not just for us in this room. It's not just for Christians. He has brought this peace for all people. He wants us to see it. And he wants us to experience it. All will know of his peace. Those long, restless days of stress, busyness, unhappiness, and arguments that's all going to come soon to an end. The selfish pictures of what you want your eternal king to be will all be erased from your memory. You will be at peace with God forever. There will be no more restless days, but an eternity of complete and absolute peace. We certainly have a gracious, forgiving, and ever-loving king. He lived humbly for us. Now he peacefully rules for us. I know you already put your palm branches here, but just figuratively raise your palm branches in the air and join the wonderful procession of your king. 
proclaiming Hosanna to the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. He saves because he has saved you. Lay down your overcoats and make way for your Savior who has come to rule peacefully for you. Rejoice with those in Matthew 21, 9. It said, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Don't miss out on your Savior. He's right here for you. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Amen. At this time, I invite you to please send any prayer requests that you may have. You may text those to the number that you see on the screen, 806-773-0516. You may also send in any offerings that you have digitally through the Venmo app. In person, there's an offering plate there on the back if you want to leave an offering here in person on the way out. You have a couple minutes to send in those requests.
Please stand for prayer. Included in our prayer this morning, we have several prayer requests that have come in. The first one is Gerald Asplund, our brother in the faith up in um, Portales, New Mexico. His friend, Sean, is recovering from surgery, so we, we ask the Lord to be with Sean as he's recovering from surgery. Mark Rambis, we've been praying for him the last week and um, included him also in our email prayer request this week, is a friend of Julie Seals, and he's recovering at home, which is great. So the, it sounds like it was a successful surgery. Now he's healing, and so we, we pray for that continued healing and recovery. Maddie, who I called Lucy last Sunday, it's actually Maddie is the cousin or niece, I should say, of Nathan Seals, um, who had the go-kart accident. She is also recovering, but she is in a lot of pain and she's having trouble sleeping. So we ask for recovery for all three of those, Gerald's friend Sean, Mark Rambis, and Maddie. And then finally, Andrew Martins, who's Pastor Emeritus, I think we could call him. Um, he's uh, Peter's dad, and he is in the hospital right now, and he has low sodium counts, and there's a lot of effects with that. So we ask the Lord to be with Andrew Martins as he's recovering in the hospital, and they do all the tests. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. We'll begin with the song responses. Dear Lord, we ask you to be with Gerald's friend, Sean, Mark Rambis, the friend of Julie Seals, and Maddie, the niece of Nathan Seals, as they all are recovering from either surgery or health issues, and we just, Lord, ask you to be with them, grant them a smooth recovery, and bring them back to the greatest health that, so that they can function well in life and not suffer. Dear Lord, we also ask you to be with Andrew Martins, who has recently been admitted to the hospital with low sodium counts. We know that you are in charge of all things, Lord, and we know that through these tests and everything, you can find out the source and bring him to healing and home, back to home as well. We ask you to bless all these people in your name, and we join in the prayer that you yourself have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, as he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palm in his path. So may we always hail him as our King, and follow him with perfect confidence, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Yeah, you thought that'd be funny. <laughs> I'm ready for the mask to be done, but we wear them for other people's sake. So. It's great to worship with you this morning. I have plenty of palm fronds in front of me. These do not need to remain here. If you want to take some of them home, you may. And there's awesome guidelines that you can look up a YouTube video that you can fold them into a cross, which is really cool. So you can take a couple of them. Maybe I think, I don't even remember. Is it two or do you just do one? But take as many as you want home. Yeah, Braylon, if you need to know how to fold them, Braylon's got them. She can teach you. Oh, Mrs. Stoliker, Beth. Beth can teach you. So everybody line up behind Beth and she'll teach you. So it was great to worship with you this morning on this Palm Sunday. And now, obviously, this is the start of Holy Week. And so I've got a slide that comes up here that is not good for those on the live streaming. And I'm sorry, it's just too much information and it's too much details that it doesn't come up clear. So I'm going to speak to all of these dates. Obviously, Palm Sunday is today, but this Thursday is Monday, Thursday, April 1st. No fooling, it's Monday, Thursday. At 7 o'clock, we'll have our worship service, and we'll have communion at that service. So hopefully you can join us for that. The following day is Good Friday, and that's the day that Jesus obviously died. And so on that day, we will have the service of darkness. It's also called the Tenebrae service. We'd love to have you join us for that service. It's a very in-depth and meditative service, and I hope you can join us for that service as it really makes you really evaluate your faith and see what Jesus went through for you. At that service, you will be given a, a nail at the beginning of the service, and at the end of the service, you have an opportunity to put that nail into our old rugged cross. And that nail symbolizes your sins and how heavy it was for Jesus to take on that punishment. So when you put that, that nail in the cross, visualize your sins being laid on Jesus because that's exactly what Jesus did. He took your sins from you. And when you leave that nail on that cross, leave your sins there figuratively, you see that his, your sins are gone. You come back on Easter morning, those will be filled with Easter lilies as you see that your sins are now washed clean as white as snow because that's exactly what Jesus has done for you. So I hope you can join us for those services. And then there at the bottom, you see all the Easter Sunday things, which is this next Sunday. We have our sunrise devotion at 8.30. Now, what's so special about that sunrise devotion is it's typically our communion Sunday, which is the first and third Sundays of the month. But because Easter is so busy and a lot of times we have a lot of visitors and they don't know much about our communion practices, we'd rather not just open it up and just make it mayhem and not have, have confusion. So the communion for that Easter Sunday will just take place in that sunrise devotion. So hopefully you can come for that. If you would like to have communion and receive that, come for the sunrise devotion at 830. We'll have communion in that service and a quick start to the Easter day. And then we'll have Easter breakfast right at nine o'clock which there'll be plenty of goodies in there, and I hope you can join us for that. And then the big Easter, Easter festival service at 1030, followed by the egg hunt. And yes, we're going to have some green grass for the egg hunt. It's going to be great. So I hope you can join us for all this Holy Week and all the events leading up and, and celebrating what Jesus has done for us, that he is our Savior. Even though he was humble, he's the best king of all. After Easter, we begin our next... We... Re, we, we Resume, thank you, I was looking for that word. We resume our Bible study that we started a while back, but we skipped for the last four weeks because we did the case for Easter. We're going to be back now into studying the life of Jesus through the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So hopefully you can join us for that as well. Those are the announcements that I have. May the Lord bless your day and your week, and hopefully we'll see you again this week sometime.